The first reading comes from Acts chapter 2, verses 14a, 36 through 41. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. The second reading comes from 1 Peter, the first chapter, verses 17 through 25. Since you call on a father who judges each person works impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it is not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you are redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you bleed in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart for you have been born again not of perishable seed but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of god for all people are like grass and all their glory is like the flowers of the field the grass withers and the flowers fall but the word of the lord endures forever and this is the word that was preached to you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. 
And they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the gospel of the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia, Christ has risen from the dead. He cannot die again. Alleluia, alleluia, amen. Two Sundays ago when we celebrated Easter, we heard the words of the Easter angel that said to the women who came to the tomb, Do not be afraid. And then remember what happens right after that. The women leave the tomb. They hurry away to tell others what they've seen. And as they're going, they have an encounter with Jesus. And now Jesus says the same thing that the angel says. Do not be afraid. Clearly, there is something about Easter that is meant to take away our fear. Our fear of death, its causes, the condemnation of sin. Fear is removed because Christ is risen. But then today in 1 Peter, we heard what might sound initially like a contradiction to this message of, of not being afraid, because there we were told that we should be afraid. I wonder if you caught it. It was right there in verse 17. That was the first verse of the reading. It says, If you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of of your exile. Now the time of exile is the time that we spend here in this fallen and broken world because as long as we live here we are not yet home with the Lord. And so here's what we want to think about as we live in this time of exile. What is it that we are called to fear as God's children? And even as we think about that at the same time we want to hold fast to the words of Jesus which say to us do not be afraid. And, and the first thing that we want to give our attention to is the fact that our text tells us that the one that we call our Father impartially judges each person according to their deeds. Peter's reminding us that we don't want to forget that the one that we call our Heavenly Father is at the same time the one who is also our judge. There's someone to whom we must give an account of our lives. Now, does that mean that, that faith in Christ doesn't save after all? St. Paul wrong in Ephesians chapter 2, and he says that we've been saved by grace through faith, not by works? No, of course not. We, we can only be saved by the grace of God as we rest by faith in the work that Jesus himself has done for us on the cross. But what Peter wants to remind us is that our deeds are like a window into our hearts that, that reveals to us whether or not we actually are resting by faith in all that God has done for us in Christ, or whether our trust is in something else. So we should be afraid of living as if our faith is not in God. If we find that we are acting in ways that show that really where we place our hope is in our possessions or perhaps in pleasure, we ought to be afraid of that. Or uh, if our deeds prove that our hope rests in our health, maybe, or in our government, or in the, the strength of our nation's economy, if that's where we put our trust, we ought to be afraid. If we won't show love and compassion to those around us because our love for self is, is too great and takes away our concern for anyone else, we ought to be afraid because that shows us something about the condition of our hearts. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 6 that if we will not forgive others their sins against us, well, our Father in heaven will not forgive our sins. So that tells us right away that a lack of forgiveness on our part, again, reveals a, a dangerous condition of the heart. And so these places and many others in Scripture keep on reminding us that we ought to be afraid of living in ways 
that reveal that we don't think that God and his presence for us and his power for us and his promises for us are enough for us. Now, there's plenty of things that people are afraid of in the world. And perhaps especially right now, we think of what's taking place in the world in which we live. But as you look at society around you, as you see what's going on in the news, as you listen to what other people are saying, would you say that, that in general, there is a healthy fear of God and his judgment? Or would you say that in all the fears that people have, that people are in some way leaving God out of the equation? What about this? What about the things that you and I might be saying and doing and thinking each day? Do these reveal to us that we have a proper fear of God, a proper understanding of him as our judge? There's a temptation for Christians to think that because Jesus has died and because he has been raised to life again, and, and in all of this, his promise that in him we have forgiveness of sins, that what that means for us is that now there's nothing to fear in our behavior, as if somehow sin no longer matters. But our reading today is calling us away from a careless attitude like that, and it says to us that we should conduct ourselves in fear. In fact, picking it up right there, Let's listen to what Peter goes on to say. He says, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Okay, now think about what, what we're being told here in this, this part of the passage. We're being told that something better than the most precious metals, silver and gold, something more precious than that has ransomed us or purchased us, bought us back from, from the power of sin and has now placed us within the family of God so that we have the privilege and the honor of calling God our Father. And of course, the price that's been paid, we're told here, is the precious blood of Christ. And a part of what makes his blood so much better than silver and gold is that those aren't going to last forever. They will pass away with this world, which is itself passing away. But the price that Jesus paid will last forever. And so the temptation is to think sometimes something like this. Well, if the price that Jesus paid is permanent, then I have less to fear. And yes, in a, in a wonderful way, that is the very saving gospel, isn't it? We don't have anything to fear in death or in life. But then God says here to us in 1 Peter chapter 1, conduct yourselves with fear, knowing that you were ransomed by the blood of Christ. And so what that says in part is that we should be afraid of turning this assurance that we have of forgiveness through the blood of Jesus into an excuse for sinning. Because what that would actually show by our very deeds, is that we don't ourselves think that the sacrifice of Jesus is that precious after all. You know, when you think about it, it's pretty humbling, isn't it? That even we, the ransomed children of God, have to be told in his word to fear his judgment. It's certainly not surprising to us that the world would need to be told that, the world and all of its rebellion against God and all of its unbelief, that the world would need to be told that it needs to wake up to a holy fear of God. But the fact is that today our text is telling us that we who are God's own children have to be reminded of that. That we have a sinful nature that, that sticks to us throughout our time of exile. And even though we have heard and have believed the saving message of Jesus, we have a sinful nature that still needs to be threatened and, and warned and crushed with this sense of fear because otherwise what happens is we keep running right back to the very sins that we've been rescued from. C.S. Lewis reminds us of the sad truth that the sinful self acts like a dog that's just been given a bath. 
and maybe you've had a dog like that. You, you, you give it a nice bath, you get it all clean. And if you're not careful, if you don't keep it confined, it will immediately go out and roll in the dirt again. And in a similar way, what can happen with us, as soon as we get the fear of God's judgment out of our hearts and minds, the sinful nature tempts us to shake ourselves dry, as it were, and run off and, and reacquire that comfortable dirtiness again. You ever had that happen to you? Maybe, uh, maybe God awakens in you a sense of, of sorrow, repentance because of something that you have done hurtful or something you've said hurtful to someone else. And so you go to that person, you apologize for what you've done and you confess your sin to God and, and you are certainly forgiven. And because you are forgiven and washed clean, things are better. But then a little bit of time goes by and you do the same thing again. It's the sinful nature, isn't it? And because the sinful nature operates in this way, because it keeps on wanting to return to sin, we got to hear the message of 1 Peter chapter 1 that reminds us of the judgment of God and that warns us to conduct ourselves with fear. Okay, well, true as that is, that there is this temptation to live as if there is no judgment, to live as if uh, there, there is no, no accountability for our actions there is also another temptation. And the other temptation is this. It's to live as if it's our fear that saves us. As if somehow by being fearful enough, we could be terrified into true faith and into godly living. But that's also not true. Fear of the judgment of God has never saved a single soul. And it won't save yours. The only thing that saves, the only one who saves, is Jesus himself. And he does it by having forgiven our sins by his death on the cross. And that's the message of mercy, really, that God is pressing us to in our text when he reminds us that we have been bought by the precious blood of Christ. So, so the preaching of the fear of God has this intention that it wants to actually move us to the mercy of God. Famous Presbyterian theologian R.C. Sproul once asked the question, why is it that a, a painting by Rembrandt, let's say, of an orange, why would that painting cost more than, a, than an actual object that he painted? So, so let's say that he paints an orange. Why would an orange that he painted cost more than an actual orange that you could buy at a store? You know, one's the real thing. One's just a, an imitation painted on canvas. And he says, well, the reason why it would cost more to buy the painting is because the painting is worth more. Obviously. Okay, but why is it worth more? Karl Marx had the labor theory of value. You know, value is determined in some way by how much work, how much labor is, is put into something. Okay, so let's suppose that, that you or I were told to paint an orange. Even though it might cost you more in terms of the labor that you put into it, in terms of energy, in terms of time, more so than what it would have costed Rembrandt to paint an orange. Nevertheless, an orange painted by Rembrandt would still have more value, even though you put more labor into it. And the reason why is because really the thing that drives value is scarcity. That's why diamonds are more precious than gravel, right? There's a lot more gravel around than there is diamonds. Diamonds are more scarce, but there is nothing more scarce than the blood of a sinless man. That's the point that Sproul was making. And there's only ever been one sinless man, and that's Jesus. As we with reverent fear acknowledge God's judgment of sin, the promise that we sinners are given here in our text today is you've been ransomed. You've been bought by the infinite treasure of Christ's precious blood which was shed for you on the cross. 
that this was the price that was paid in order, in order to ransom your soul for, for all of eternity. And we should take comfort in that. Now, at the same time, because God knows how weak we are, and he knows how, how quick we are in our sinful natures to return to sinful behaviors, he also gives us the promise of his own power now at work within our lives by the Holy Spirit. And so here's what it says in the closing verses of our text. Picking it up at verse 23, you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. God's word is power for you. It's not passing power. It is divine power. It is a living word that remains forever. And it is preached to us, proclaimed to us by the very power of the Holy Spirit. And here's what the Spirit does to us and in us and, and, and works for us as we encounter his word. On the one hand, what he does is he shows us our sin through the word. And he works in us a holy fear that calls us to repentance because we acknowledge the judgment of God. But then, by the word of his forgiveness, as we hear the message of what Christ has done in giving himself in our place, fear is removed. That is, the fear of judgment is removed because now we know that all of that judgment was poured out on Christ himself so that with a confident faith, and now a reverent childlike fear of a loving father, we begin to live lives that show that we trust in him, in his holy and precious name. Amen. Now may this word keep you steadfast in the true faith until life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you alone are worthy of our fear and of our trust. By your Son, you have given us your eternal promise and peace. Turn us from every anxious thought toward your fatherly heart, which you have revealed to us by the precious blood of Christ the crucified. Do not let our faith rest on the shifting sand of this world's comforts and securities, but only on you. Help us to seek first your kingdom and righteousness, confident that you will add everything else that we need and you will work every circumstance together for our good. God of might and wisdom, in these days of pandemic, give to all political, civil, and medical authorities the gifts of prudence, clarity, moderation, and a spirit of cooperation that every word and action they take may be sound and effective for the benefit of the people they serve protect them in their service, give them humility in their callings, make them honorable in their work, that we may all benefit from the fruits of their labors with thanksgiving given to you. Merciful Lord, we pray for a speedy end to the pandemic, but as we wait on your mercy, we pray that you would preserve those who are sick and that you would comfort those who are fearful and dying with your word of life. Hear us as we pray by name for those from among us who are dealing with various health concerns, especially remembering before you Brianna, Scott, Jamie, Lauren, Ron, together with others that we name silently before you. Receive our thanks for the birth of Kiara Estelle Nash. Graciously guard the lives of mother and child and bless both Christina and Nick as parents as they care for Kiara and welcome her soon into the kingdom of your grace in the waters of holy baptism. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus, our Lord, who has taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Good morning. Perhaps some of you are learning about money in school right now, or you have already, and so this isn't any surprise to you. You know how to count coins, but a penny is a dollar, or a dollar. A penny is a cent, one cent, not much. But you get five pennies, and you get up to a nickel. A nickel is better, but still not much. Two nickels, a dime, you got ten cents. Still not going to buy much of everything, but much of anything. But when we get up to a quarter, 25 cents, now we're talking. Now you can buy something. You can go to those vending machines in the store and, and put it in there and see what's in that little egg. Or, or maybe you can find a candy bar or a video game that you can play for a quarter. Quarters are where the, the money starts, starts paying off. It starts, starts working for you. But if you get four quarters, you get a dollar. And if you get $5, you get a, a $5 bills. And I, I've heard that you can get 10s and 20s as well. We like our money. We like having bills, dollars to go and spend. Uh, if you have enough money, you can go into the store and buy a cake or, or a, a, a fishing pole. Or if you have even more, you can buy a remote control car. Or if you have more, you can buy a motorcycle or even a pony. We love the power that money gives us. We can go and buy something with it. But I've got some other money here. These are, are from Haiti. These are from our, our trips to Haiti. And, and these are called goods. And, and goods are, are, are worth a little different amounts. But um, all in all here, I have about 600 goods. And uh, it's probably worth about $6. Uh, but if I were to go to Walmart and pick out $5 worth of stuff, maybe a few Pokemon card packs, and set them on the counter and say, I'd like to pay, here you go, and hand them these goods, the cashier would look at me and go, mm-mm, nope, can't have that. These Haitian goods are no good here. We don't know how to count them. We don't know their value. And uh, so, so I can't pay with them. Even though it's money, even though it has value, here it doesn't work. Here it's no good. Today our scripture lesson reminds us that our money is no good when it comes to buying eternal life. <clears throat> we like to think that having lots of money will let us live longer. We can buy best, the best medicine, get the best doctor, go to the best hospitals so that our body can be taken care of. But, but when it comes down to it, uh, even the best doctors and the best medicine can't keep us alive forever. We can't buy eternal life with money, not with dollars, not with goods, not with yen, not with francs, not even with TP. No money can buy eternal life. But there is good news. First Peter 1 says that you were ransomed. That means bought back or saved, not with silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus. The price for eternal life isn't paid with money. No, it was paid with Jesus' blood as he died on the cross. He paid for you to have eternal life. And not just you, but for the whole entire world, he paid the price. What great news! Even with empty pockets, we have the gift of eternal life already purchased for us by God because Jesus gave it to us. Today, we continue to celebrate Easter. We celebrate the resurrection of Jesus and the gift of eternal life that you can't buy. But on your behalf, Jesus already did. Will you guys pray with me? Say, dear God, thank you for Jesus, for paying for life forever. In your name we pray.